Therapy Chat Podcast, episode 225. This is the Therapy Chat Podcast with Laura Reagan, LCSWC. The information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. And now, here's your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. Today's episode is sponsored by Therapy Notes. Between writing notes, filing insurance claims, and scheduling with clients, it can be hard to stay organized. That's why I recommend Therapy Notes. Their easy-to-use platform lets you manage your practice securely and efficiently. Visit therapynotes.com to get two free months of Therapy Notes today. Just use the promo code THERAPYCHAT when you sign up for a free trial at therapynotes.com. Thanks also to DoxyMe for sponsoring this episode. DoxyMe is an easy-to-use, HIPAA-compliant telehealth platform that is available in free and paid versions. Get $50 off a paid account by going to doxy.me and putting in the code THERAPYCHAT. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. I'm your host, Laura Reagan, and today I'm very excited to bring you an important discussion with someone whom I greatly respect. I'm going to be talking to Dr. Odelia Gertel Krabel about responding to trauma during a crisis. Odelia, thank you so much for being my guest on Therapy Chat today. Thank you for having me, Laura. You're welcome. I'm grateful that you could give your time to meet with me today because I know just like all of us, you're doing so much right now and, and you always are, but you are so knowledgeable about trauma and crisis work and supporting people in the midst of a crisis. That's not when we do trauma therapy. Trauma therapy is after the crisis has passed. So when there's a crisis event going on, like what we're all experiencing right now, you know, there's a, there's a shift in the way therapy looks or therapy should be practiced. So thank you for, again, for taking the time to come and talk with us about that. And before we even dive into talking about that, will you just take a second to tell our audience a little bit about yourself and what you do? Uh, Yeah, I am a trauma therapist and I have done crisis response and development work for over for almost 25 years. I'm originally from Israel and I used to work as a peace activist and then I became a therapist and I worked for the UN both in Africa and then I was a focal point for crisis intervention in the Philippines and worked in several countries in Asia. And then I moved to the US. In the midst of all of this, I developed expressive trauma integration, which is an approach to respond to trauma from crisis intervention to trauma therapy that addresses all aspects of wellness at the same time. And and we'll talk a little bit about that today and why it's important to, why it's important to pay attention to that from the moment the crisis takes place and after it's over and things are going back to routines and normal. Yeah. So your expertise is immense. And I'm, again, so grateful that you're here. As all of us who are trauma therapists are probably hopefully aware, we, you know, we, if we were doing in-depth trauma processing work with our clients up till a few weeks ago, now that this pandemic is happening, everyone is in this collective traumatic experience. So you can't be doing, it's not safe to do trauma processing work in that environment. That's right. The difference, I mean, what happened, first of all, this is a global crisis. So as you said, everybody are experiencing the same kind of, um, not exactly the same kind of, because our, our responses are subjective and personal, but we, but objectively speaking, we're all dealing with the same kind of threat. Some of us are more vulnerable because of health issues, Uh, or different uh, background issues that would make an impact on the level of our stress right now. But we're all, uh, the majority of us at least, are at home or some sort of, uh, some things have shifted in our routines. Even if we are going to work, 
uh, we're dealing with significant more stress and many different variables that were not present until a few weeks ago or until a few months ago for some of us. And so we're all dealing with something that is intangible. We don't see it. It's not like something that someone is marked with or, uh, you know, a threat or a missile that is coming or an other. When you are talking about conflict, there is the, the one versus the other. This is like something that is so intangible that we're trying constantly to put meaning and narrative to to context that we don't that, that, that we don't have. So we're using symbols and we're using imagination and we're trying to be as uh, creative as we can to express something that we're still in a state of shock. We're not we're at the beginning stages of dealing with it. And so this is not even the time to 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 process what is happening because it's just started happening. When we're talking about trauma survivors, our, our, our clients that we work with and, we, and we, we worked on trauma processing or grief work, the majority of most of our clients are not interested right now to do that for many reasons. The first reason is that they are also uh, in high level of stress. And so if they felt better or if there was significant remission of symptoms of trauma and stress symptoms right now, um, at least most of the people I work with, they are in some sort of some sort of regressions and the defenses are really, really up high. And many of the symptoms that were on remission are now coming back or intensify significantly. So they are in such hyper alert or, or either very, very numb that they won't be able to do grief processing and trauma processing right now, nor that we would want to do that with them. Because what we want to focus with them right now are bringing them back to the here and now to, to provide concrete plan on what and how to deal with certain things. And I'll go over the things that we need to, to, we need to do with our clients and constantly reinforce and reconnect them or rebuild or build and establish resources. And everybody has resources. The moment that someone is listening to us right now on this podcast or the moment that someone is coming to therapy, they woke up in the morning whether they took a shower or not, it doesn't matter. They woke up, they are looking for information. This is a resource. This is a seed. From that, we can build something on and help them uh, using imagination and creativity to get in touch with what's inside, even if they think they don't. And and it's likely that they think they don't because they're, because as we know, the body is like a sponge and the more we experience stress, the more the sponge is full. Mm. It's and there is nothing to soak in anymore. We need to we need to squeeze the sponge a little bit so it will be able to absorb more. And the way we do that is encourage some sort of activities and movement and and sleep that would enable the body and enable them to engage with us a little bit more. For example, uh, some of my clients, I will have, I mean, all my clients and I have a journal together on, on regular days, not just right now. So many of them will write me more. Some of them will not write at all. They're just not able to engage with that right now. So we will text more through WhatsApp or I will talk to them. We'll check in. I will schedule check in with them. Some of them at night, some of them early in the morning. It's intense. That's why the way that we practice right now needs to change and shift for many different in, in many different ways uh, to adapt. And at the same time, very, very important is that I won't be able to give my clients what I am giving them unless I take care of myself. And it's a little bit like I when I work with parents, I say to um, or all my clients who are parents, I say to them, well, you need to model what you want for your children yourself. So if you want them to be in a certain way, then you be that certain way and then they will model that. And so I, I do work very, very hard. And I say work, I really treat it as a part of my work to maintain my self-sustainability right now. And I have an extremely strict um, routines that I follow Besides Saturday, which is my the day that I really allow myself to just do whatever I feel like doing, 
But during the week, I if I don't do A, B, C, D, I really feel the toll and it's significantly harder for me to work the following day or to function or to parent or to just be. Yeah. Well, you're talking about something that I'm sure is resonating for almost everyone who's listening, because for the therapists who are listening, we are all the difference between normally being a therapist and now is that we are all going through this while our clients are going through it. So, you know, there are just as many changes in our lives and just as many, you know, trauma responses that we're having to this crisis. And we are here to support our clients, which is great. But if we aren't taking care of ourselves, like you're talking about, and this is, this is, I think, beyond just the idea of like, oh, you should really take some time for yourself. It's like the only way you're going to get through this is if you are extremely intentional about all the practices you need to take care of yourself so that you can be there for other people. Yeah. And, and I, I want to go, uh, I, I really want to provide a list for the people that will listen sure. but that we really need to maintain right now because we, we just have to. Uh, I, and I also want to say something about us being a part of having a crisis as well as our clients. It's really important that we share with our clients that we are not super human, that we're human, right. that we are also struggling but of course, in a way that would not facilitate or increase their symptoms, because I have my own therapist. I work with my own therapist uh, about my own personal or difficulties, just like my clients have me. Me too. And so I think it's really important that my clients would know that I'm human and, and we're all in this together because we really are. Mm -hmm but yet not to share with them the particulars that are not relevant for the relationship with my clients. And I know, I mean, it's given for us, but I still think it's important to emphasize. So I, I want to talk about the things that we really need to, um, to incorporate right now. I have seen it in many places and it's not new, but I'll still, I'll still mention that because because it's really critical and it's it's not just critical for our emotional well-being it's critical for our physical well-being and our physical well-being is what is going to determine how we're going to how susceptible we are to get sick or recover from sickness and it's impo it's something that we are we need to take under consideration at this time so the first thing is to maintain routines uh, routines is our is the core of of the of our stability. I'm not talking about a military regime that uh, we need to wake up at six in the morning and and do and and plan it from six six fifteen a.m. and etc. Everyone knows themselves and they know what works for them. And some people need to sleep later, and some people need to go to sleep early. Uh, and if they are not, then they need to work with someone at least once to help them build that routines or, and, and practice it for a week and check in again and, and practice for a week or two and then adapt it in a way that it's really important not just to, to make a routine and practice it, but also practice and succeed in practicing. Because when we are putting, when we're putting down a list and then not being able to fulfill it or it's too strict or it's not right, then especially for people that experience that are trauma survivors, we're also adding another element for for failure. And we don't want that. We want exactly the opposite. We want self-efficacy. So so work on, on a plan that is manageable and individualized to every one of us. And the second thing is gather information about what is happening in a very mindful way. Don't watch the news all day long, don't uh, have, you know, all kinds of uh, notification on your cell phone and everywhere. Social media really limit the time that you're exposed to stories that are difficult to anything that will take energy out of you. Uh, that makes you feel down. This is already a difficult situation. And we all know that there are a lot of people that are having, that are exposed to tragedies right now. And 
I know I, this is not coming from being insensitive or it, it's the opposite of not being the, the, the layer of protection is getting thinner by the day. Yeah. You really need to maintain it, maintain a buffer. And so it's really important to keep that buffer and treat it as if it's an entity. I personally, I look at the news not more than once a day and very, very briefly. And I try very much to avoid social media as much as I can, um, unless it's things that are related to my work. Uh, and also choose who you're gathering information from. There is a lot of opinions from this and that and do this and don't do this. And if you do this, this will happen. Uh, there are some authorities. Um, I can't. I, I, everyone needs to choose what are the authority that is right for them, and then stick with them. And and I think that that can s- somehow help them preserve the buffer. Another thing that I think is really really important to mention is sleep. Mm-hmm. One of the most restorative. I mean, it's it's the number one restorative thing uh, aspect that we can. That I wish it was easier. But for the most of us, uh, especially the ones who are trauma survivors uh, and a lot of the symptoms are coming back, sleep is very difficult. And sleep is very much dependent on physical activity and we're not as active as we would like to be. And sleep is also very much related. I mean, our nervous system is also related to our uh, social connection. So everything that we usually have as a resource right now is significantly more limited so find ways to be as active as you can during the day. If you live in a house, walk up to down the stairs several times. Um, if you're sitting a lot, put an alarm for every hour and go up and down or go from one place to another. Find a way to do some jumping jacks every hour, something that will energize your nervous system and and cause some movement so you will be tired enough to go to sleep and if it's very difficult for you still talk to a health professional about finding some things uh, whether it's herbs or some kinds of teas or supplements or medication or anything that would help you maintain sleep that would not harm you on an ongoing basis that we're not going to start numbing the situation and take substances to to deal with it. And then we will, after the crisis is over, we will need to deal with that. So a- again, everyone needs to work with someone that they trust to investigate the sleep situation. <laughs> I mentioned movement and I want to emphasize more about that. Our pull to sit still and be frozen is so significant when we're stressed. I mean, how many of us have been arguing uh, intensely with someone or driving through a highway or something, we got startled or something. So what we want to do afterwards is withdraw and freeze almost, or we first freeze and then we want to withdraw and then freeze again. We really want to just be under a blanket or just basically don't do much. And, and many of us want comfort foods, box type comfort foods, what we call comfort foods that are maybe comforting for a moment. But so what happens is that we sit much more and then we eat much more and we eat foods that are not very nourishing for us and the recipe is not very good for us because um, movement is helping us deal with inflammation Mm -hmm. well helps us deal with inflammation so find some sort of things that you like to do for example I tell all my clients to make two playlists one for calming 10 minutes and one for uplifting and and work with them or work with yourself and find out what do I need right now? Do I need to calm? If I need to calm, it means that I just feel I need to exert energy. It's something is really difficult for me right now. It's hard for me to breathe or or I am very auditory sensitive or light sensitive. So I need to calm. But if I feel that I'm very tired and fatigue and um the mood is is very low, then I probably need uplifting. And I don't mean at 1 a.m. in the morning. I mean in the morning, in the afternoon, early evening. Then just play this 10 minutes, even if you don't move. If you can move, great. If you can dance a little bit, move lightly. Uh, Listen to the rhythm, uh, follow the beat, great. If you can just even sit and close your eyes or just sit and pay attention, sing 
Sing the, the, the lyrics. These are songs that you chose. Singing is is increasing our vagal tone. Uh, it's calming our nervous system. It, uh, and more than anything, it's intentional mindlessness. We feel joy when we sing. It increases how we feel, uh, our mood. So it, it's one of the best things to do. Is Get a lot of breath. Yeah, exactly. So... Uh, so from movement, from sleep, we got to movement, and from movement, we got to joy and, and intentional um, activities that would either calm us or enhance our, um, in, make us feel more alive. I really encourage people to avoid too violent music, violent movies, scary movies, Video games, I am sorry for everyone and all the ones with teenage children, uh, boys and girls, or young adults that are very much spending a lot of time on their Xbox or whatever other platform playing shooting games. I highly, highly, highly recommend to try as much as possible to limit it to as much as possible I am significantly not as against uh, TV because when we're watching TV, it's almost like um, our brain is able to empty a little bit. So I'm not so much against it uh, as much as video games, especially the shooting ones. It's they're so much engaging and the nervous system is so, so active and children are immersed in that so much that uh, it's just too much. It really, I mean, right now, especially because everyone are stressed and children, whether they are exp- they are um, expressing that or not, they are impacted by that. They're not as active. They don't see their friends. They don't go to school. Um, so whether... Well, and they pick up on their parents, the way the parents feel as well, of course. And, and they had life before this. So they had things that happened to them before this as well. And so... The last thing they need is to um, supposedly engage in let's shoot this or let's be killed with this. It's I'm sorry if I mean, I argue with my own children about it a lot. But uh, as young people say, unpopular opinion, but. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's exactly. So that's what I just said about that. So I want to emphasize also about eating clean. What we eat affect how we feel and how we feel affect our gut. Mm-hmm. And so what we eat affect our gut and how we feel affect our gut. And both of them affect the gut. And the gut is the number one area uh, with the majority of environment that affect everything else in our body. And if the environment in the gut is exposed to a lot of stress or to a lot of inflammatory foods, then it will eventually impact the level of inflammation of in our body or our immune system, how we are able to be susceptible to any kind of illnesses. It doesn't have to be just coronavirus. And so we really need to be mindful to what we eat right now. And, and I know that it's not easy and we also don't have access to as much food as we would like because especially uh, fresh fruits and vegetables exactly and so as much as possible try to be mindful to reduce sugars although we really want to eat a lot of sugar right now and drink a lot of fluids that are comforting like warm water with lemon chamomile tea um everyone whatever works for them not too much coffee, not too much anything that is overstimulating. You know, I'm not against coffee in general, but I've been feeling so much higher level of stress that I've just realized I can't drink coffee right now. And I haven't had any since this all started. But, you know, interestingly, I didn't get that coffee headache that I usually get when I don't drink it. I don't know what that's about. But, you know, it's like I can't take another level of stimulation. I'm kind of trying to keep calm. (laughs) So much so, me as well. I, I don't drink coffee, which I love. I love the smell. I just can't, I, right now, I cannot tolerate it. Same goes to alcohol right now. Try as much as you can to avoid, you know yourself, Every each one of us know ourselves and how much this or that affect us. I believe that people that are more, that are trauma survivors that experience a lot of chronic stress are more sensitive to substances. 
Um, what I mean by that, that it would impact them more than other people. And what I mean by more is not necessarily make them more high or less high or more numb or less numb. It's just more inflammatory. Mm -hmm. So if possible, this is a time to really try and, and limit as much as possible the intake of anything that is not healthy by some standards, by uh, the inflammation, the anti-inflammation diet. And I think everyone can Google that and find there are many different variations of the anti-inflammatory diet. They're very, uh, they're ones that are significantly easier and ones that are very strict. So every one of us needs to know what writes for them. And it's a practice and it takes time to know that as well. And it changes with the level of stress and experience that we're going through. Another thing that I want to uh, emphasize is uh, self-reflection and and the notion of meaning and purpose at this time. It's very difficult. Many people are out of a job right now, or if they have a job, they cannot do it as well as they want to because of many different reasons, starting with not actually being at work. And we need to, again, I'm saying we need, we need, we need, and it's a lot of things we need to do. And these are hard things to do. So while we need to do a lot of things, at the same time, we can do what we can do. But if possible, to find small pockets of things that we're good at in what we're doing at the moment, to find small things that gives us a sense of meaning. It could be a connection to someone. It could be making masks for other people, mobilizing people from one place to another through uh, social media, anything that would make us or the person we're working with realize that we matter because we matter. And it's difficult to feel that we matter because we're isolated and we are, we cannot connect as well as we would like right now. And everything feels less, not more. And the things that feel more are not the, the good ones. They're the ones that feel too much. Mm. So uh, it's important to get some guidance and help and maybe journal. What brings me meaning right now? What used to bring me meaning? And, and maybe connect to that. What am I good at? Everybody has resources. We have talents. We have beliefs. We have hobbies. We have things we're good at. Everybody has something that they're good at. Let's stick with it right now and try to enhance it. Are you good at in, in making puzzles? Let's do puzzles. Let's think about things that we can connect people. Like, I mean, the creativity is endless. I see people doing so many wonderful things right now. They give, um, you know, art classes online, dance classes online, uh, free courses. It's just the possibilities of doing things right now, and many of them are free, is, re are, is really unusual. So there is a as, generosity that you're seeing come out in many people, which is very heartening for me, you know, with when a situation that feels, you know, in some ways, when you feel like you're in like survival mode, it's like dog eat dog world, you know, fight for get what you can get all the toilet paper. But, you know, there are also people who are saying <laughs> who are saying, you know, I want to help. I want to give some of myself. I want to do something for others. So it's, it's surprising to me how, how much people have shown their best. I, I, this. And, and I think it comes also for, because we, we, we're, we're so longing for connection right now and we're so longing to find meaning and it's very difficult to do that alone. And, and because we also want other people to, I mean, because we are in pain we know that other people feel likely very similarly to us and and it's and we want to connect on that aspect and we want to share with others and so it's it's it is it is wonderful and and it's a good resource so if people are at home and have nothing to do their courses almost anything right now is possible as long as people have the capacity to sit and just even a little bit try and, and begin practicing something and make it more a part of their routine. And I understand that it's very, it's complicated because we don't know how this will evolve and when will it end. So what we do know is that we, the truth is we never really knew. We never knew anything about what's going to happen. We, we, let, we lived in routines that were more flexible and we didn't need to engage with these 
thoughts, at least many of us or some of us, all the time. And so let's focus on what happens today, tomorrow, until the end of the week, not more than that. We don't know. We really don't know. And it's not easy for any one of us to focus, to not know what happens in a month or two months, or when are we going to, when will this end? And are we going back to routines and how all of it going to impact us long term? And will it end and, 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 and so tangible quality that you mentioned? Yes, it's like you can't grasp it. You want to know what what's going to happen? What's going to happen? It's very, very difficult. Uh, But the thing is that for trauma survivors, when we're dealing with the lack of certainty, that everybody has to a certain degree. But for, for, for trauma survivors, it's significantly more complicated because the threat of death is now and everything feels like now. Mm-hmm. And so we, we want to help our clients or help ourselves to be in the now. What am I feeling right now? I'm feeling scared. Well, everybody feels scared right now. It always brings me back to self-compassion And the way that I practice self-compassion is a little bit more simplified because I found it to be easier with my clients, especially is I'm not even saying, may I be kind to myself? I'm it's, it's a very easy exercise that everybody can do. What am I feeling right now? I'm feeling uncomfortable or I'm feeling scared. One to 10, how scared am I? Anything above five, I would probably do this exercise. Uh, Five, Uh, sorry, um, eight. Well, Fear is a part of life. Everybody are scared right now. Everybody are scared always, but they're right now specifically scared. It's okay to be scared. I'm okay. Right now at this moment, my name is Odelia. I'm okay. I am safe. To do it over and over and over again uh, with my clients. I mean, they know it by heart. They heard it so many times and they know it so well that they begin to practice it and then they teach it to their children and then they teach it to their neighbors. This, this is what we need to do. We need to focus on right now. And even if it's uncomfortable, it's uncomfortable for everybody. How do we learn to live with uncomfortableness without being swallowed by it? Mm. It is looking at it. And I know how difficult it is. I mean, of course, it, I have moments that I cry and I have moments that I'm scared. And then I recoup and I come back and I said, again, I'm going back to what's going to happen in the future. I'm scared about what happens in the future or whether things that happened to me in the past are going to repeat themselves in the future. Mm -hmm. But I'm not in right now. And right now I'm here. I'm okay. I am safe. I'm at my house. I am at, I'm doing this. I'm doing that. Focusing on an action and, and, or focusing on what I am feeling right now and humanize that and then go back to grounding and say, I'm here, I'm now, I am safe, I am okay, that's okay. It's okay to be scared, it's okay to be sad, it's okay to be upset, it's okay, everything is okay, because we all feel it at some, t- at some point, all the time. Doesn't mean it's, uncom- it's comfortable, it doesn't mean I like it, no I don't, but that's how it is. Let's just pause for a moment so I can give you a little bit more information about why I love therapy notes. I switched to therapy notes a few years ago. I'd say it's about three years now, I believe. And I have never regretted it. I was very happy with the EHR I used before, but therapy notes is more intuitive. I love the interface. The customer service is fantastic. And I love how I can get my notes done quickly because I can customize the template that I use for my notes and there are opportunities to put check marks rather than having to write out the intervention used. So I have cut my time spent writing notes way down, which is wonderful because I like to focus on seeing clients. I know documentation is an important part of our work, but it can also be time consuming and that is why I love using therapy notes. If you are considering switching EHRs or you're looking for one to use in your practice, give therapy notes a try. You can get two free months by using the code therapy chat. Now let's get back to our interview. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for what you've shared so far. And, you know, we have 
maybe about 15 minutes more. Can, can we shift into talking about how we work with people? And I mean, I think what you're going to talk about is something that isn't just for therapists, right? Anyone can do psychological first aid. Mm -hmm. And there will be moments in all of our lives when someone is going to need us to be able to help them in a crisis. Yeah. So let's, let's move into that. So psychological first aid uh, is done immediately after a crisis takes place. So, I mean, even if we are in an ongoing crisis, from the moment that some critical incident took place, critical incident is anything from a car accident to unexpected uh, death or crime or violence or a pandemic or something that is unexpected, that is critical. So from that moment until up to two to six months, depending on the situation, the intervention should focus on uh, psychological first aid. From two to from two to six months, the next intervention would be psychosocial support, which is therapeutic engagement focusing on on containment and resource based therapy. And only when we assume safety. What I mean by some safety is that the crisis is over and people are in stability. They know where they live. They have everything they need. And basic needs are met then. And when we have that for at least six months, we can engage with trauma therapy. Yeah. And, and, and then we add the element of sustainability that needs to be addressed from day one. And sustainability is all the aspects that I mentioned when we first sp spoke uh, the routines, the sleep, the diet, the movement, the practice of enhanced joy, uh, intentional and mindlessness or mindfulness, the self-compassion, sleep, etc. That is the sustainability. The sustainability aspect when we are addressing in with a therapist usually is what makes it difficult for me to, to practice it. So we can call it self-care. The reason I call it sustainability is because the the the, the, the stage of self care move to be, become sustainable is when we add a contemplation on what can I achieve in self care to sustain myself and what I can't and why can't I? That is the therapy. That mm -hmm. is the aspect that makes self care um, routines too sustainable. So the five elements of psychological first aid from the way that I practice it in the expressive trauma integration, it's a little bit different than the, the ones that, that other organization or the UN has practiced. It starts with uh, engagement, uh, initiate communication. So communication with a therapist or a hotline or something like that took place. The second aspect is provide educate psychoeducation explain to them about how stress and trauma works in the body and why well, likely almost everything that they're experiencing that feels very uncomfortable and unreal or unnormal is actually a normal response to an abnormal situation this is very abnormal situation so if you find it hard to sleep or if it's hard to focus or you feel more achy uh, and I don't mean just the symptoms of uh, if I'm getting sick or not. It's usually because uh, the body is under an enormous amount of stress right now. And and the majority of us have experienced things before this. So as I said before, it's a sponge. So it's all coming together and we just feel like the bucket is overflowing and we just don't know what to do. So these are normal responses. And some people will need more detailed explanation about the nervous system and why we need to do A, B, C in order to help the nervous system calm and practice activities that, that to help self-regulation. Some people will not be able to, to uh, retain this information, so we just need to give an overall and, and just help them repetitively say, I'm right here with you. I see you. It's very difficult. It is difficult and, and it's okay. We're okay. It doesn't feel fine. It doesn't feel nice. And that's also okay. This is a normal response. This is how er almost everybody feels right now. The next stage would be, do you want to say something? Well, yeah, I just wanted to say, I think this, you made an important point about some people will need more explanation about neuroscience, but some people really won't 
be able to take that in. And I think sometimes as therapists, we tend to get up here in our heads with the jargon and we need to be able to really stay attuned with how much is this person able to process of what I'm talking about right now? You know, are they with me? And why am I even saying all this right now? You know, (laughs) am I doing it because I'm nervous? I'm trying to prove what I know or am I meeting them where they are? Exactly. So that's an important part of crisis work. The third one is uh, establish a sense of safety. And that means helping them immediately self-regulate and not just, um, you know, some people do uh, headspace. No, that's not going to help. We need to help them immediately regulate. And the majority of people, at least the ones that I've worked in crisis, and I have to say my own experiences with myself as, as a teenager in a war or next to terror attacks, never for me, it was situations, well, to the most part that I was frozen. It was always needing to exert energy. The nervous system was so hyper that I was shaking or people around me were shaking. And it's so that for me means that we need to exert the energy. We need to move immediately. And so I have the best exercises I've ever used is the reset exercise. I'm going to give you the link for it and the slide that you can add to it. It's so simple and easy. It's basically jumping 20 times, 10 to 20 times, very, very fast because it's really reset the nervous system. And then we take uh, a few guided breaths with pausing between the inhale and exhale. And as we exhale, we we make a sound of or mm, to engage the parasympathetic nervous system. Never failed, ever. Um, That's the first one. And, And there are other reset exercises, but that's the one that most people need. Uh, it also helps for people that are numb because it it, it, ba- it does what it's supposed to do. It resets everything. And the body gets to into such a, like it, the brain and the body and the nervous system says, what's going on? I'm jumping so fast. And, and so, and then I'm taking the breaths to engage with the parasympathetic nervous system. And so I, I really encourage people to 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 do that and when they do that especially as a first responder or as a therapist I always say that to everybody I will never ask anyone to do something that I don't do myself so if I ask someone let's just start walking let's just start walking right now let's just uh, even in front of the computer when I do uh, e-sessions so I will start walking with them I'm not going to say stand up just by themselves. I'm going to stand up with them and I'm going to model to them so they can copy me. It's already helping to copy someone else. And there's an attunement again there. There's like an attachment piece that mirroring like with child child therapy. Yeah. Or or parenting. (laughs) Not everything is just about child therapy. There's also actual parenting. (laughs) The attunement comes with the breath, especially when we do it's 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 very even even in e-therapy it works really well when you look at someone just like you and I are looking at each other and 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 you're guiding someone to breathe and and hopefully i mean people who become therapists are usually they want to they want to give something because of many different reasons and Hopefully, we all care about our clients genuinely. I mean, I do, but I hope everyone, I, I assume everyone else does too. And so we, we're connecting to them on a human level and, and they feel it. And only that is coming. But when we do the reset and that together after it works really well, then afterwards, we want to help. After that, when people are calm in their intervention, we want to help them identify the vulnerabilities and and it, it, it's it varies from one person to another some people it's really a physical location it's usually in situations after an earthquake or something like that that you need to help people find out what are the abcs well this is so much like when i when i would work with people at the hospital who had gone there after sexual violence or domestic violence It's like, do you have a safe place? You know, do you need to change the locks? Here are some resources, you know, so 
same thing. It's that, and also the the other the the, the less imme- the, the secondary uh, secondary for immediate the immediate vulnerabilities. Like um, some people, uh, it will be some substances that we don't want them to start using. For some people, it will be relationships uh, around them or some sort of support or I mean our vulnerability is different from one person to another I mean again it's it goes back to the list uh, that I mentioned it could be the news it could be social media it could be even different connections or family relationships it's so uh, so help people identify in what what are their triggers what are the vulnerabilities and how can we minimize that as much as possible of course sure. The next stage, the uh, stage number five would be reconnect to resources. It's from the the basic resources that each one of us have from the fact that we're alive, add into that as as longer list as possible to help people connect to what are their resources from relationships, uh, social community, um, religious community, any community, work, family, anything. Pets are a wonderful resource. Any kind of resource, knowledge is resource, hobbies are resource. So help them connect to that. Some from the immediate practicals of of you know assume that they're safe, etc. And some are related to the weekly plan that we talked about earlier. And then lastly is a system with sustainability, which is again creating the plan, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the most important thing, again, I'm saying a lot of things to do is to be realistic about the fact that as much as we would all like to be as functional and as you know, think about it from a more ideal perspective, it's not possible. We're human, we're not We super- wanna feel normal, but it's this isn't going to feel normal. No, no. We're we again. We're, we're human, not superhumans. Yeah. So mothers out there that gets angry, or the fathers who gets angry or gets upset, or they're not taking wonderful Instagram pictures in front of the camera and able to show that life is just wonderful, or they're just making a peach pie or whatever pie or whatever else, or they just don't. The comparison of how people have their social media and actual realities is, is just a moment. We don't really know what happens to people's life. And no one is getting it easy here. No one. It's difficult for everybody. And so it's important to know that it's okay. We're all struggling and we're good enough. We're not super. Yeah. And as you said earlier, we really are all in this together. Yeah, we are. Odalia, thank you so much for sharing all of this. I mean, this is really helpful. And I think people, therapists and non-therapists are going to really benefit from listening as well as any, you know, anyone, all of us during this time. So where can people find more of what you're doing? I know you're going to give me the link to the reset exercise, but I want to be sure we give your website too. Uh, my site is pretty, I mean, I'm going to give you the link and it's pretty easy to remember. It's eti.training. Okay. And it stands for Expressive Trauma Integration. So I, yeah, I think everything is there. I have a blog on psychology today. You put out so much wonderful content really all the time. I just appreciate you so much. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I appreciate your work. Thanks. So once again, I just want to thank you for being my guest today. Thank you for having me. Stay well and safe, everyone, and you and us. Yeah. Today's episode is sponsored by Therapy Notes. There are many ways to keep your practice organized, but Therapy Notes is the best. Their easy-to-use, secure platform lets you not only do your billing, scheduling, and progress notes, but also create a client portal to share documents and request signatures. Plus, they offer amazing unlimited phone support, so when you have a question, you can get help fast. To get started with the practice management software trusted by over 60,000 professionals, go to therapynotes.com and start a free trial today. If you enter promo code THERAPYCHAT, they will give you two months to try it out for free. Thanks also to DoxyMe for sponsoring this episode. DoxyMe is an easy-to-use, HIPAA-compliant telehealth platform that is available in free and paid versions. Get $50 off a paid account by going to doxy.me 
and putting in the code therapy chat. Thank you for listening to therapy chat with your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. For more information, please visit therapychatpodcast.com.